Welcome, everybody. Thank you for that music, Therese. I appreciate it. We're just giving people time to jump on. We might have a couple more people jumping on, and that's great. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today is our No Justice, No Peace Transformation and Justice Collective session on trauma-informed healing-centered practices with Hala Curry. I'm so excited. Um, uh, so if you can, if you're able to, please come on camera. We would love to see all your beautiful faces and just be together as a group. And if you can't, totally understand. But it'd be wonderful to see you guys. Um, mm -hmm. just so, just a reminder that we are recording this session. So if at any point you want to speak and don't feel comfortable being recorded, please feel free to let us know either send us a chat or, or just let us know. We'll pause the recording for that time. Um, and then just so you guys know, our team will be acting as facilitators during the breakout session. So I'm just going to invite our team to raise your hands so people could see you. So just so you guys know who the facilitators are. And then um, we're gonna start by doing a quick report back on last um, month's sessions and healing practice. So just any reflection, either personal or organizational that you guys might have had, if you guys wanna share either in the chat or just speak out. So anyone's welcome to share. And I know we just jumped in here. <laughs> All right, so if you guys want to take a deep breath together. <sighs> so just quick reminder, we're recording. I invite you to turn on your cameras. Um, feel free to ask us to stop recording if needed. And um, any reflections that you would like to share from last month. That's where we're at right now. And you could go ahead and write it in the chat, or you could just speak out loud. And this is regarding like the workshop that we had last month on healing practices. Friday, end of the day. <laughs> I'm going to admit that right now I cannot remember what we specifically talked about. But I, I do know I missed the video about body listening, and I wish I would have been a part of that, but I got the slides. So with that being said, I'm sure I'm not the only one thinking that. Could you please remind us? So please remind you of what we talked about last month, right? The healing practices or specifically the um, body and body listening. Are we talking about the body listening or the one before that, the original one? Either one, either one would be. Any reflection you guys did as an organization or personal on either one. Um, Bobby speaking, um, for when we did our uh, staff uh, reflection together, um, it was really nice for all of us to be able to get together and, you know, just reflect on a, a lot of us did miss it, uh, but the one before that, we did answer some slides, so thanks, Jim, for facilitating that, and we'll rotate, but um, I had put on one of the slides, like, um, like it had me in a, in a place, like a soul searching place, but it was like in a good way. Like it broke me down, but it built me up. Like it was like I had got some strength, but I'm always uh, reading uh, Mrs. Hollis stuff. So um, I think it's just a combination of me just trying to apply uh, better practices within myself and stuff. So I was really encouraged, right? I was tore down. I was, you know, feeling like, I don't deserve to be in all this space, but then like it empowered me too. So I just want to share that. And that was for the first one. I missed the second one, I'm sorry. I appreciate you sharing. Yeah. And for all of you guys, a reminder, Tessa went ahead and put it on the chat. Anyone, any other reflection anyone wants to share?
Yeah, I also missed the, the second one, but the first one I thought was great to have sort of this, this space open for, for all of us because I think, I think sometimes we just carry with our own personal stuff and, and with the people we interact the most usually is our coworkers, right? So uh, sometimes it's, it's good to just kind of clean spaces within, within our own collective because it, it could it could create like unclear communication between our coworkers and all kinds of other things. So I know I know Autumn who's here from Huerta del Valle mentioned that she would have wished to see more of our team members um, participate because there's definitely um, quite a lot of stuff that that could be very useful for us to grow not not only personally but as an organization. Um, and, and, I, and I really do truly appreciate having the opportunity to be here and, and do these, these kinds of circles because for me, it's, it's super, super like hyper important to have this kind of like space, not only at work, but even at home, right? It's just have these kinds of healing spaces for everybody to have the clarity that they need to to do what they love doing, which I believe everybody here, you know, has a deep passion for everything that they're doing. So thank, thank you everyone for, for even listening. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? I'll try to give it a try if you can hear me. Been having a lot of technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. Okay, hear you. awesome. Um, I love the part about when uh, we were doing active listening basically where you sit and let the other individuals speak without trying to butt in or offer any help or, or assistance. And I forgot the beautiful lady that was um, talking last time, but she touched my heart. I still have her in my heart, even though I don't remember her name. And um, also um, the, the activity about breathing and stuff like that, because today I was really frustrated because my computer has just not been working right and I'm trying to give my weekly report to the team and I'm like <sighs> I'm trying to bring it down and de-escalate so I'm really looking forward to this and I thank you all and Jen was amazing when we had it and within our organization so I'm looking forward to today I need it thank you thank you anyone else and just, I am seeing the chat and I see people posting on there their reflections as well. And they're beautiful, I appreciate them. Michael, Autumn, yeah, Marlene. So this is the uh, first workshops coming back to me. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm a part of starting over and we did talk about that, right? And, and so it reminded me um, when I first started this work in 2017 and how, how you can pick up people's energy easily and take it home with you and neglect yourself and neglect, neglect your, um, your partner, uh, your relationships, including with yourself, right? And so the fact is I had to learn um, through my mighty warrior, our executive director reminded me, if you're going to be this in the long, for the long haul, you got to self-care. And so I didn't know what self-care looked like because I've been self-harming myself for a long time. Uh, still do right? Emotionally eating and all those things. And so um, again, very unhealthy for myself. And I won't be able to be there for my partner, my uh, family, my friends, and the people that I work for and with. Uh, and so, so this is good tools to learn so we can uh, take care of ourselves. And like I said, be there for the other folks and then in turn, teach them how to have healthy habits as well. Right? Because we all relate. I'm a case manager and I talk to our folks and they, um, they are no different than us. And, uh, and so I have to remind them what codependency looks like, what personal boundaries looks like. And the more tools that I have, the more in turn I can share that with them and they can become better parents, better people and spread the seed, right? So I love this space. And, and, and uh, like the gentleman, Mr. Lopez, cannot pronounce your first name, sorry, mentioned that the fact is even with our staff, right, our, our colleagues, so we're no different. We have a lot of pain, we might be sensitive and um, we can't be that way necessarily, right? There's a time and a place, we should not take things personal. It's not about us, it's about the community. So again, I love these spaces so I can learn this kind of knowledge and I can spread it. Appreciate that. I appreciate the vulnerability as well, right? The process of 
we move so fast, you know, you saying, oh, I don't remember. That's such a true thing about our work, right? We're moving so fast with all this information as well. So I really appreciate it. That. Yeah. Anyone else want to share? We have a couple more minutes in this space. I'll give you guys a chance to look at the chat. There's been some awesome reflection on the chat right here. Appreciate Michael's reflection around common unresolved trauma amongst everyday people, right? And we don't necessarily walk around with a sign that says, yes, we have trauma or we're scarred, right? And so I appreciate you noting that. Some of us hide it better than others. Yeah. <laughs> but they say you spot it, you got it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Tracy shares she's had the opportunity to get back to her morning routine grounding. That's amazing. Yeah. Sometimes we need these trainings to remind us of the things that we might already know, but sometimes forget to do for ourselves. Yeah. All right. So thank you guys so much for sharing back in your reflections. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to introduce our trainer for today, Hala Curry. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Vanessa. Thank you, Sissy. Um, I just wanted to say again, everybody, thank you so much for being here with us. It's such a honor and a privilege to be in this space with you all. Um, and I also have think, today the privilege to introduce our speaker for today. Um, so Hala holds a bachelor in a psychology and two master's degrees, one in counseling psychology and one in community psychology with an emphasis in liberation studies and social justice. The focus of her work has been personal, interpersonal, and uh, systemic trauma. And she has been teaching yoga and movement for over 25 years and has been doing clinical work and organizational trainings for 15 years. Hala is also a co-founder of the Off Mat Into the World, which is a leadership training organization offer, offering embodied leadership and social justice trainings to yoga and meditation practitioners, as well as activists. She also trains direct service providers, community organizers, and educators on how to be trauma-informed within their community work. Her book, Peace from Anxiety, Get Grounded, Build Resilience, and Stay Connected Amidst the Chaos has been published. And as a Lebanese immigrant in a multiracial marriage who also gets white skin privilege, Hala is often able to be a bridge in the work of equity and inclusion with diverse groups. So please, everybody, welcome my speaker for today, Hala Curry. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Bobby, I'm so glad you're here. Bobby's been doing some of the um, some other community work that I've been doing. So it's nice to see you here, Bobby. And maybe others have. I don't recognize your names. Um, so I'm so happy to be here today. And what I really want to talk about with you all today is healing. And even though the word trauma isn't so much of the the description of this work and so much of the work that I do, um, I really see trauma as the life experiences that shape us. And just because we go through something traumatic doesn't mean we're broken because of it. We can be broken and fabulous, broken and brilliant, like one of my friends likes to say. Um, and that's really what I want to talk about today with you all and make some of the connections between some of the information about how we're shaped by our lives into how we show up in our leadership into how we practice self-care. And just like Griselda said, did I say your name correctly? Griselda? Um, yeah, that that is what we then give to our clients and the folks we're working with, right? That the more that we're embodying our own valuing of ourselves, right? That's how we can support others to value themselves, right? And at the heart of social justice work is helping people feel like full humans and trying to change the systems that rank human worth. Right. And we internalize that for ourselves. 
we rank the parts of ourselves that we think are valuable, the parts that we think people should see. So I'm really interested in that inside out transformation. Michael, you said in the chat, do we have to do the personal work first if we're going to set the stage for this organizational work, right? And I don't know what has to come first, but I start with the personal because that's just my doorway in, right? If you're, if the world is not oriented to your care, you can do all the personal work in the world, but we need the systems to change as well so we can be well, right? But I've seen this too much in activist spaces is that we just embody capitalism and patriarchy and white supremacy culture, right? In our bodies and in our organizations. And so I'm really interested in disrupting it within ourselves as much as we can so that we can participate in a liberatory culture and in a liberatory way of being together. And so I hope to talk about that with you all today. And I really want to encourage you, if you want to like raise your hands or take your mic off and talk or chat at me, um, the more interactive this is, um, the funner it will be. And um, I do want to invite us to chew on these ideas together. So I think I can, I can't see all of you. I can see most of you. If you hit the raise hand icon, I can know that you want to speak um, as well. And the chat, maybe all my other collaborators can help me see if there's anything showing up in the chat that we need to look at. So I want to start by getting us into our bodies a little bit. So do what you need to do to get comfortable. Maybe you like take something off your lap or you lean back a little bit. Whew, just take a moment to attend to your body. And the first thing I want you to do is just like check in, like, how am I right now? How do I feel? Maybe you haven't checked in yet today. Maybe you've spent all day checking in with others, right? Check in with yourself for a moment. How was this instrument of my body in this moment? What are my sensations like? Is there any particular emotion present for me? Check in with yourself how you might check in with a loved one, right? Or someone you work with. Notice what's with you right now as we begin this work together. And I'm going to invite you to put one hand on your heart and another hand on your solar plexus. And with your hands on your body in this way, feeling the preciousness of your own being, your own breath, your life. Feeling your own brokenness and brilliance. Allow your breath to deepen a little bit. And you might imagine the breath washing through your body like healing medicine. And if trying to breathe deeply is not accessible to you, just let the breath be spontaneous. Let your breath do what it wants. And just see if anything begins to settle simply by you deciding to get present with yourself. Just notice if anything begins to settle. And then go ahead and release your hands. And we're going to do a tapping practice. You take your hands, you're just going to tap on the top of your head four, five, six times. And then you'll go out to your temples and tap here. And then go to your forehead. And then go underneath your eyes. out to the jaw and then take one hand underneath your nose above your lip and then in your chin creased chin crease and then both hands to the center of your chest and then your thumbs to your side body good and then just release your hands and notice how that feels if it's settling at all for you. My hope today is to share a few things with you, a few tools. Some will work for you, some might not. And we're gonna go deeper into this in the next session. Notice what works for you. And then we'll just take a little side stretch together. So just take your right arm up and you can reach it straight up or you can lean whatever works in your body. 
If your neck is tight, you can take the arm back a little bit and let your head go. Be gentle here. Ooh, you might circle that right arm, take one circle here and then come on up and then go to the other side. Left arm up, reaching. Good, maybe you take the arm back a little, let your head go. And then circle the arm one time. Huh, and just let your shoulders shake out a little bit. Ooh. Huh. Good. <laughs> if we had more time, y'all, I would put the music on and we would go, but that's for a later session. So just take a moment to, to notice how you're feeling now and what's with you. And notice if anything has changed. And I'm just curious if you felt a shift in any direction, if you could share it. You can type into the chat or, or raise your hand and unmute yourself. Do you feel different? Do you feel better? Do you feel worse, right? Tell me what you feel. More alert. Mm -hmm. I do too. I needed that. More relaxed. I definitely feel the energy because I'm tingling. Ooh, yes. And that tingling sometimes is literally like releasing stress from the nervous system. It's a release. It can be. Energy and warmth down my feet, somebody's saying. I realized that I'm in like a ton of shoulder pain and like didn't know all day long. Right? <laughs> like my shoulders are so like actively in pain and I had no idea. Yeah. So, and like sometimes like that stress just becomes so our normal baseline that like until we like really tune in, it's just what we know, right? We don't even notice it. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy's saying, saying very present, energized, but grounded, a good neck adjustment. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, so, you know, we just did what, like two minutes of breathing and moving. Right. And it was a, we were able to change our state. Okay. And so really like, I'm going to spend the next 90 minutes explaining that <laughs> and having you dig a little deeper into your own process. Right. But, you know, our bodies, um, I like to say our body is like our GPS. It's like the guidance system. Like I can't go anywhere without my GPS on in my phone now. It's very sad. I don't know how to go anywhere, right? But our, our nervous system and our bodies, they guide us. And, and the signals, the sensations in our bodies, um, they can tell us how we feel about things outside of us, right? Uh, little, some, some tears came up. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing how simple it is sometimes when we just pause, but I want to say the other important part is we're in community together. You're not just alone doing this. It can be powerful alone, but being in community amplifies the medicine. I, I feel it and I'm facilitating and I still feel that like, you know, um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about our bodies being that GPS and how we want to take care of our nervous systems so that we can be sustainable, so we can take care of ourselves. And so we can show up for those who need us more authentically, more grounded, less burnt out, okay? So I'm gonna take you through a little framework and a somatic framework. So my training is in a technique called somatic experiencing, which is a body-based therapy that addresses how trauma lives in the body. And a lot of my work got developed working with system involved and incarcerated youth because I started one of my students um, was working in the halls doing hip hop and spoken word with um, the young folks. And she was like, come teach yoga. And uh, I went into central juvenile here, hall here in Los Angeles and started teaching yoga. And these kids had so much trauma, right? Personal trauma and systemic trauma. And uh, I was able to bring the work of somatic experiencing this trauma work into yoga classes. And so it's, you know, a lot of this work was developed with folks on the margins. And I'm like, okay, if, it's, if, it, if it doesn't work for the folks that feel least cared for in our world, then it's a useless tool is the way that I see it, right? And so um, I love sharing this work. So I'm gonna share it with you all, okay? So I just wanna pause and see how you're all doing. Questions, comments, we're good to go. Okay, and you can like stretch and move whenever you want, whenever you want. So someone's saying, 
far more focused and present and connected, realizing how I can easily forget about checking in with myself. Exactly. Right. And so my hope today is to help, help you all build that muscle, build that muscle of resilience is what I like to say is how I like to call it. Okay. All right. I don't want to lose your faces, but I am going to pull up the PowerPoint, which I discovered, by the way, there's a way you can set your screen up so you can see the whole group and make the PowerPoint small. So when I go into sharing the screen, um, I want you to think about the experience you want to have. Since we're so much on Zoom, um, you, I want to make sure that like, we can also create an environment on the Zoom that works. I'm the presenter now, so I don't see it so much, but you should have like a bar at the side of your thing and you can put it on grid view. Oh, I'm doing it. Grid view. And then you can stretch it out. And I don't know from where you stand, the PowerPoint will get smaller. It's not happening for me now, but when I'm a student, it happens. So if you want to mess with your view, if you'd like to still see the group, you can do that. Or if it's easier for you to just see the PowerPoint, you can do that. Okay. Um, so we're talking here about trauma-informed and healing-centered practices. Um, and specifically today, what we're going to review is what do we mean by trauma and resilience? What is self-care and healing? Like, what does that mean, right? One of you were saying, like, I don't even know what that means. And how do we talk about self-care in a way that's meaningful too, like meaningful specifically to you? We're going to talk a little bit about critical consciousness, and we're going to start to go into these tools. I'm going to give you the tools throughout, but the next session, Scarlett and I will be co-presenting, and we're going to have like a full-on healing session of really diving into these tools together, okay? Um so I talked about how what we're doing here is we're working on building resilience, right? Building resilience together. The definition of resilience, there's a few different ones. So resilience typically is defined as our ability to recover from adversity, to bounce back. But like the truth is like there's really a bouncing back, right? Like sometimes you don't want to go back to where you were, right? Like where, where you were at was part of the problem, right? You want to like bounce forward, <laughs> um, so I like to think about resilience as our capacity be, to be transformed by trauma or difficulty, our capacity to be transformed. Um, if you think about your life experiences and you think about the things that have really made you who you are, I bet you a lot of them were difficult experiences, right? Ones that you wouldn't have chosen to have, but they shaped you, right? Do, I, do you all agree? I can see some of your faces. Yeah. Like you wouldn't have signed up for that, right? but it made you who you are. You know, I often talk about how, you know, being in war when I was little, being an immigrant family here, like that was all really, really difficult, but I kind of think I'd be an asshole if I didn't have those experiences. <laughs> you know, I think about the level of empathy that I have, knowing what it's like in my own small way to feel like I'm not, to feel marginalized, right? Uh, in my own small way to, to know some of those experiences and to know what it's like to be at a place that's experiencing chronic violence, right? So for me, yeah, I wouldn't have signed up for that, right? And it's made me who I am, right? And it, it's always a combination, right? It's not always like a, we see how we grow because sometimes we're also dealing with uh, the ways that we might feel more broken and like that we're healing, right? The other thing about resilience is that it can also refer to an inner knowing that we can handle difficulty that's ahead of us. I don't know about you all, but when I'm really anxious, I'm anxious about what's to come. Right? It's not even so much about the past. I'm just afraid of the future. Right. So when we feel resilient, we feel like, you know what, I can handle whatever, whatever's going to come, even if it's scary, I can handle it or I can get support if I can't handle it. Right. And again, I want to be careful that I don't want to be like espousing an individualistic notion of what it means to be OK. This isn't about like you can do it by yourself on your own. Right. This is also about like I would reach out for help if I needed it. Right. And that's like like to me, that's really hard because I miss like I have to do it all by myself. And the scariest thing for me to do is ask for help. Right. Um, so those are the two definitions of resilience. Um, when we're talking about trauma, I want to remind us about post-traumatic growth, okay? That, again, I, most of the time when people experience overwhelming events, they are not broken by it. And again, I don't want to dismiss the ways that trauma is terrorizing and harmful and awful. And I don't want to box folks into being broken because of it. Because for a lot of survivors, there's all that shame, right? 
And I just want to pause for a moment here because I'm setting this framework, right? I'm setting this framework of trauma and of resilience and of self-care. And I just want to like check in with you all to, to be like, to ask you like, why are we talking about this and how does this connect specifically to your leadership? I want, I want to hear from you a little bit before I unpack it. Anybody want to share like, how is this, how would this connect to your leadership and your work? This conversation, you can type into the chat or you can unmute yourselves or raise your hands. And it's not a test, it's just a conversation. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm a case manager, so I deal with a lot of folks that are re-entering back into what we would say society, right? And they've dealt with a lot of uh, trauma. And I relate to it. And it could trigger me. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go there because we want to move forward. We want to be present and move forward. So um, it's good to check in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And to have the tools to like, when you are triggered, be like, all right, I'm going to ground, I'm going to breathe, I'm going to do what I have to do. And then I'm going to go get support. That's <laughs> the part we often forget. Mm -mm. Hence why I got emotional when we, when you did a, how to do the grounding exercise, because I'm fairly new to uh, meditation or be mindfulness, uh, but when, but, but been working on myself for nine years and it's still right. So the point is, whenever I have to like work on me or focus on me or be there for me, it's um, still a sensitive subject. Oh yeah. Yes. I think but that little awesome. girl, that little girl inside me said, don't be forgetting about me. Yes, absolutely. And I'm pretty sure you're not alone, right? Like a lot of us drawn to this work. We're really good at being there for everybody else. Right. We're fixers. We're fixers. And part of it is we don't want to have to feel our shit. We're good with everybody else's. <laughs> it's a really good distraction. Totally. I so resonate <laughs> with that. So resonate with that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Michael's saying that it gives you a compassionate foundation of understanding. Absolutely. Right. When we don't have that compassion for ourselves, it's harder to give it to others. Although a lot of us will give it to others first and not for ourselves. <laughs> right. Toya saying that it's healing for you. Yes. And, you know, if we're in the business of wanting to help people be well, we have to feel like we deserve to be well as well. Like we're, it's actually going to limit what we can do for folks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the hardest part is feeling like you're deserving of it. Like sometimes what you said, and, and I definitely um, echo what Chriselda said is that uh, we're, I'm so busy being a caretaker of others when it comes to me, I, I don't even know where to begin. Sometimes it's like, I don't even know where to begin. And, and then I'm telling myself you deserve it, but I'm not sure if I believe myself. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And in fact, we're going to dig into that question a little bit more later on today. A hundred percent, Jen. Yep. I've, um, I've noticed a lot of folks um, have the same pattern of being raised in a society where they said, if you think about yourself, you're being selfish. Yes. Right. So, so that we, we, we really took that to heart and we followed it our whole life. Mm -hmm. And then we teach it probably to our children too. Absolutely. Um, so we're continuing that generational gap of self-help and self-care and self-love. Yeah. And if we came from families that had to deal with trauma, right? And there wasn't that capacity to take care of ourselves because we were being oppressed, we were being harmed, we were being attacked, right? That be that's, a, that's something we had to do, right? And then that gets passed on, it gets passed on. Yeah, I was literally told by my mom that like people who were like relaxed were like superficial, you know? <laughs> like if you weren't like working yourself to the bone, right? My mom would just look to me, hala, look at them, hala. You know, like there was like, <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to be okay. You know, you're not supposed to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's like a lot of patience. I come from a family of uh, street vendors, you know? So for, for me, I grew up with that mentality of like, you know, if you're relaxing, you're not working, you know? So it's like work, work, work from day to night. Uh, so having patience, patience with, with, with everyone, including myself has been like super key because sometimes we want projects to like just be realized, you know, like this, because we impose our own capabilities on others. And we're like, well, I 
you know, we start comparing each other and it just becomes like a, a whole, it, you, you begin to break down the team rather than like collaborate as a team. Yeah. But for me, like I've been learning a lot of that with my current role with Huerta del Valle is, is, is having that patience because we all have different skills, different backgrounds and different ways that, that we, we work, you know? So I think for me, it's that, it's like the patience and, and yeah. continuously learning to be patient. I really resonate with that. And part of it could be also, as we understand that people deal with stress differently, some of us deal with stress by speeding up and doing more. I'm like that too. Some of us deal with stress by slowing down and shutting down. So like I can lose my patience with somebody who slows down when they're stressed because I speed up. I don't know if you resonate, right? Yeah. My yeah, husband wants to take a lot of deep breaths with me because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to give you a brief framework and then I want to put you all into some groups so you can chew on some of this uh, together. And what I want to do is, give you some definitions of trauma. Um, and again, trauma, not necessarily to traumatize you, but trauma that can also make us stronger, right? So a definition of some of the overwhelming life events we can go through. I do try to keep this part as funny as possible. So I don't want to trigger you and get you too overwhelmed, right? So we're really talking about a broad overview now. We're not going to dive deeply into our personal traumas today. We're just going to get curious about our life experience and what shaped us. Okay. So if you do feel some of that vulnerability, just, just again, remember like only go as far as feels right today. And we're just kind of stepping back and having a broad overview. We are going to be sharing resources. I don't know if it's up on the website yet, but we talked about like resources for like mental health support. And um, uh, Bobby was mentioning it. I have tons of resources online to support. So, you know, today I want you to like, just kind of keep the boundary of what feels appropriate for you and know that we can support you to get support, support you to get support, to go deeper because you don't need to do this work alone. We do this work while we're being held, okay? Okay. So um, as we're talking about trauma, I want to outline, th um, I want to outline, um, I wanna give you definition, right? So the definition of trauma, that I like to work with is that trauma is anything that overwhelms our capacity to cope and respond. And it leaves us, well, it's not on the slide. It leaves us feeling helpless, hopeless, and out of control, right? Something that's overwhelming and that we can't deal with. Um, and that's a very broad definition. And with that, we, we have what's called big T traumas and little T traumas. So big T traumas are the things we often think about like violence or abuse or car accidents, all those big things. But then there's these like smaller traumas that are overwhelming because they are, they are associated with a particular developmental stage. So I often joke that I have hair trauma. I mean, my hair looks really good today, I will say, but I have really frizzy hair, right? And I grew up in Miami, Florida, 100% humidity. My mom would cut my hair. She's not a hairdresser. All right. And when you're 13 and you're an immigrant and you're already different, right? A bad hair day overwhelms your capacity to cope and respond. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and so even though that wasn't like the trauma of violence or the trauma of that, it really shaped me. It exposed the ways that I didn't belong, right? Um, and it really shaped my identity. So, and I'm sharing this to say, as you're reflecting on the things that have shaped you or the things that have shaped the folks you're working with, right? We're, we're, we're also gonna be curious about life experiences that were like intense, that made us who we are, right? It's, it's all those life experiences we wanna think about, okay? As we're reflecting on what has shaped us, okay? The first category of trauma is shock trauma. Shock traumas are events that happen to us, right? They happen too fast and too soon and they overwhelm us or they terrorize us. And these are events like violence or witnessing violence, car accidents, natural disasters, even childhood surgeries, even you know, death of loved ones or divorce when you're little, right? These are these events that happen to you, okay? So just check in with your bodies as we're talking about this because this is us, right? It is not those people. And I want to remind you some of the tools, okay? I'm going to teach you a new one right now, which is that I want you to take a look around the room that you're in and take in the colors and the textures around you, not the things you want to clean up and organize, okay? And actually move your head when you're doing this. Maybe even say the name of the objects you're seeing.
And just notice how that feels. Usually about 50% of people will settle when they do this. Okay, it may or may not work for you, but sometimes orienting with our eyes to the space we're in can settle our nervous system. Like I, for me, it works. So I take a deep breath when I do that. If it didn't work for you, no problem, right? You can share it with somebody else. It might work for them. And then we're going to come back to our grounding, feel the parts of your body on the ground. You can also ground through your arms, just squeezing up and down the arms a little bit like this. So grounding through the arms, grounding through your hands on your body or your breath. So just make sure you're checking in with your nervous system as we're talking about this stuff, right? Yeah. The second kind of trauma is relational. It's not about having these bad events happen to you, but it's caused by a chronic and ongoing misattunement between your child and the primary caretaker. Right? So human babies are very vulnerable, right? Human babies, we are, humans are 100% dependent on the attunement of the parent or the caretaker. And so if a baby cries and it's met with warmth, the needs are met, and then as a child, we internalize that the world is a relatively safe and predictable place, right? But say our caretaker has their own trauma and they can't meet our needs. Baby cries and the caretaker is depressed. So the caretaker goes into the room or caretaker is addicted and is, in, is um, intoxicated, right? If that child's needs are not met, it's going to internalize the world is unsafe, unpredictable. My needs can't be met, right? So developmental trauma lives in us in our relationships where relationships are confusing. We don't really understand boundaries. We maybe let our boundaries get crossed too quickly or we don't know how to ask for what we need, right? So developmental trauma has a different flavor, right? Um, than shock. They can go hand in hand, okay? Um, that mirroring is really, really vital. There's a really interesting video online. It's called the still face experiment where you see a mother and a child and the child is like 13 months old or something like that. And the child claps and then the mom claps and the child points and laughs and the, the mom looks and laughs, right? There's a lot of mirroring happening, right? I know you all did, did some mirroring in one of the sessions, right? And then at some point, and the baby's delighted, you know, and at some point they, they, they tell the mom, now just have a still face, just look at the child, but don't mirror. So the mom just stares at the child. And the child claps and the mom does nothing. And the child points and the child does not, the mom does nothing. Within 30 seconds, the child starts to cry. Within 45 seconds, the child is inconsolable, right? And then the mom starts the mirroring again and the child settles, child settles. So that need to be seen when we're young is really important, right? When it doesn't happen, we can have a real disconnect about who we are, right? So now I wanna add another scenario. Imagine that the child is crying um, but there's no one there to meet its need because the child is, say, in a daycare that's understaffed and underfunded. Maybe the child is in the daycare because the parent is low income and has to work three jobs, right, to put food on the table. Or maybe the parent has been deported, right, or incarcerated, right? Maybe in that situation, the parent actually does have the capacity to offer mirroring, but because of um, financial, uh, financial oppression and poverty and racism, the parent is unavailable to be there. Now we're looking at this third category, which is so much of the work that you all are doing, which has to do with systemic or institutionalized trauma, right? And this happens when we don't have access to the resources based on race, gender, ability, religion, sexual identity, et cetera. This is that trauma of injustice, the trauma of, um, that is built into our systems, right? And so much of the work you all are doing is about addressing injustice, right? And in a, in a paradigm of trying to understand our mental and emotional health, we wanna factor in our experiences with that, right? So these larger systems of education and finance and politics and housing and healthcare, right? They don't serve everybody. In fact, they serve a few. And at, and they harm many people, right? And you all don't need me to give you a lecture on this because it's your work, right? Um, and when this isn't brought into a paradigm, you know, typically in healing paradigms and mental health paradigms, we don't talk about this. We talk about 
the shock and the developmental. And what happens? We're blaming people for their trauma, right? We're blaming communities that are targeted by the world rather than naming, hey, you're targeted by the world. And that is highly traumatic, right? You know, if you don't have to worry about your health care, you don't have to worry about your safety with law enforcement, um, and the world is oriented to your well-being, you can be pretty relaxed. It doesn't mean you don't have personal or developmental trauma, right? It doesn't mean you don't have other kinds of trauma. But in order to heal, you don't need the systems to change. You can go to therapy, you can practice self-care, and that's your work, right? But if your trauma is partly caused by these larger systems that target you, that harm you, that marginalize you or invisibilize you, the, the personal work is limited, right? Um, and so, you know, for me, this paradigm is not about creating like an, a, a competition about who's more traumatized because I would never want the person who's like most marginalized and under-resourced to think that they're the most broken, right? Maybe, maybe the systems were all not oriented to your care, but you had a strong family, strong spiritual community, right? Grounding practices that buffer you against that, right? Just like if you, if the systems are totally in your favor, you know, if you're a cisgender, white man, able-bodied, you're upper middle class, that doesn't mean you don't have really horrific personal trauma, right? So it's not about comparing who's better. It's about a distinction because then when we know the source of the trauma, we can find the source of the healing, right? Yeah. So I want to pause here because I want, in a minute, in a minute I'm going to take you all, let, let you all go into some groups to chew on this a little bit. But um, so the thing I you know, want us to reflect on is in our positions of leadership, we want to examine what has shaped us, right? Because if we've never experienced, for example, systemic trauma, we, we're not going to know about it, right? We're going to have to learn about it and read about it, right? In the places where we're privileged, we don't know. We don't, we don't really know. It's invisible to us, right? Um, I know a lot of you come from the communities that you're working with, right? And so that's also means you're going to have a particular type of empathy and understanding about what folks are going through. And like Griselda said, we're also going to be um, vulnerable to getting triggered ourselves, right? It's like so close to the heart, right? So how do we maintain that separation? Um, knowing ourselves is a really important part of showing up in our leadership and for others really authentically really authentically. So I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions about those, because in a moment, I'm going to ask you to just reflect on, again, from a broad view, what has shaped you? What are, what, what, which of those categories has shaped you the most? Is there one that has not, you know, really impacted you negatively? Um, and, and again, the places where we haven't been impacted are places where we want to learn, right? Like if you didn't, don't have any developmental trauma, right? You're not going to know what somebody's going through who didn't, who didn't have that mirroring as a child, right? So I'll pause a moment, see if there's comments or questions about that piece. Okay. So um, what I wanna invite you to do is reflect on this a little bit. I'm gonna show you this slide and if you want to take a snapshot of it, you can. We will put the questions in the chat, but you'll lose the chat. Um, I think we can put it, we can still put it there. But so first I want you to say, I want to show you that I love, you know, there's a slide I really like. A diamond is just a piece of charcoal that handled stress exceptionally well, right? That you take that coal and you bump it around and you put pressure on it. And that's what turns it into a diamond. And we're all, you know, none of us are perfect shiny diamonds. We have parts that are broken, parts that are still covered in coal, parts that are shiny, right? Um, but again, as I'm asking you to reflect on this, I want you to just think about like, what are the things in life that have bumped you around, right? So what experiences or circumstances have shaped you? And I, don't, I want you to stay broad. Just think about the categories. Okay, again, I don't want you to get too triggered so that you're not able to take this in. What can you see about the world as a result, right? So, you know, our, those life experiences determine what we can and can't see or what we can and can't access. Um, and I also want to add what strengths and abilities might you have as a result, right? Because like part of what you can see is like, that's like your part of your superpower, right? And then what might, how might this be limiting you? What is it you might not be aware of? So again, um, for me as somebody who carries light skin privilege, I had to learn about, 
the impact of racism on certain bodies, right? I had more of an experience of being an immigrant, so I felt more of a cultural marginalization in my life, right? Um, but I had to learn about the places where I'm not privileged, right? And, and again, the idea here is that your own, the more aware you are, the more you're going to be able to show up in your work with that clarity, right? Sometimes when we've had a really similar lived experience to the folks that we're working with, that can also kind of give us blinders because we assume they're having the same experience we're having, right? They might not. They might be having a different reaction. There might be some nuances to their experience that are different from ours, but, but because ours was so powerful, we, it's hard for us to see them. We just see them as a mirror for us, right? So these are your questions. Um, any questions about the questions or does that sound pretty clear? Yeah. And we, you will be in a group with one of us just to kind of help hold the space, but really it's about each person is gonna have about three or four minutes to share. When somebody's sharing, the rest of the group, your job is just to listen. You know, we're not gonna be offering advice or analyzing, right? Um, we're just going to be trying to mirror Oh, the three, the three categories of trauma, shock trauma. These are the events that happen to us. Developmental, relational has to do with our caretakers and systemic and institutional. Okay. So shock, developmental, systemic, and institutional. Yeah. Shock is like events. It's like car accidents, abuse, violence, seeing violence, natural disasters. They're events. And they can be chronic. They can, and don't worry too much about like getting the categories right. This is a little bit more of a reflection of like, wow, this has really shaped me. This is also my superhero power, right? Because of that. And here's where it can limit me a little bit as well, right? Um, and so again, when you're in your groups, when somebody's speaking, everybody else, you're just listening. Maybe you ask a clarifying question, but you're not trying to analyze or sympathize or give advice. It really is like, imagine that somebody has a talking piece and they're sharing and then the next person goes, okay? And only share as much or as little as you feel comfortable sharing, right? So you can decide what those boundaries are for yourself, okay? And if you wanna pass, you can also pass, yeah? Okay, so we're gonna go, it sounds like we're gonna have groups of, three participants plus a facilitator, four minutes each. So um, about 12 minute groups, maybe we'll just put the timer more for 13 minutes just so there's a minute buffer for folks to get into their groups. Yeah. All right, everybody ready to go? Any questions about that? Okay. So we'll see you inside of your groups. Welcome back everybody. I hope you didn't get sucked out in the middle of a conversation. I always feel bad in that moment. I apologize. I don't know what happened with the switching, but one breakout room had like six people and I hope you all had a chance to share. Um, I was like trying to move people and then all of a sudden they went in just in one space. And oh, I didn't no. point I was already sharing. So um, I hope it was still um, an enrichable experience, but um, that, was, that was my fault and I apologize. I will do better in the next breakout room. All right, and maybe you can just, so you're not rushed, set them up now while we're talking, you know, move people around when it's not rushed. I, I get so stressed trying to create those breakout groups sometimes. <laughs> okay, so um, before we move on, I just want to see if there's any, there were any like aha moments, anything that came through and um, I please share your own experience. We don't want to share other people's stories without their consent, but if you got their consent, you can share what you heard, but rather anything that, you know, you could talk vaguely about what you heard without sharing somebody's story, but any aha moments or any connections anybody made? You could type into the chat. Yeah. I made a beautiful connection with the beautiful Queens that was in the room with me. Um, I found out that we have so much alike and, uh, by hearing their stories, I feel so empowered. Mm -hmm. um, you touched my heart in such an amazing way. So I want to tell you, thank you. And I love you, ladies. Um, this is amazing. I really needed this today. Mm. Thank you, Toya, for sharing. <sighs> Anybody else want to share any takeaways? Okay. 
um, I'm trying to learn how to step back, but I'll step up. Um, mm -hmm. When we were talking about the shock, I could um, resonate with those feelings and those words that were being talked about when we were talking about shock. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bobby. And Griselda's saying, I learned that my developmental trauma shaped me to be the empathetic advocate, advocated superhero I am today. Absolutely. Right. And I think those of us that weren't attuned to, we get really good at attuning to others because it's how we survived. We had to attune to everybody around us. And I often say that's also why I became a therapist. Same thing. So I feel you. I feel you. Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to now move into to like talking a little bit more about regulating our nervous systems, right? So all these life experiences, right? They they can impact us positively in that they become our gifts, they become our inspiration, they become our motivation, right? And they can also dysregulate our nervous systems. And I wanna talk about our body as our instrument, right? And so as we're exploring all the energies that impact how, our, how we are in our skin, okay? I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, you've heard me use this word self-regulation a little bit, the definition of self-regulation that I like to work with is that when we're self-regulated, we feel grounded, centered, and present in the moment. Grounded, centered, and present in the moment. Um, and when you're self-regulated, you don't have to be like this guy, I'll chill and meditating. You can be doing a lot of things, but be regulated, be pretty grounded, be in your own center, and be in present time, okay? When we are dysregulated, ooh, Hold on. When we're dysregulated, um, wait, so here, this is like a self-regulated nervous system. Like when we have, we don't have too much stress in our bodies, when we're able to manage it, we're able to experience like sympathetic arousal, meaning something happens. It's stressful. We have to mobilize energy. We have to address it, right? We're able to do that. And then we settle back down. That's a parasympathetic settling state, right? The nervous system is meant to mobilize us when we have to take action and then let us rest when we don't have to take action, right? So, you know, for example, I'm sure all of you have experienced something like this. You're driving your car, right? You're chilling, maybe listening to music. And all of a sudden you get cut off, right? Your heart rate goes up, right? You might get hot and sweaty and you swerve out of the way, right? So if you successfully swerve out of the way and you don't get into a car accident, you have now navigated this potentially traumatic experience, right? Avoided trauma, right? And when, when our nervous systems are pretty regulated, all right, after that happens, whew, maybe you pull over, maybe you just get home and then, but then you notice that, you know, you settle back down. You're able to like put that experience behind you, right? So when we're regulated, we should be able to experience stressful things and then recover, right? And then recover. But when we're not regulated, when we're dysregulated, we're going to, there's going to feel like there's more of a lack of control over our emotional state. And it doesn't always mean we're like having a temper tantrum like this picture, but this was just the picture I used. <laughs> Sometimes it is a temper tantrum, but it feels like we can't control our reactions. We're going to be reactive rather than responsive. Our behaviors and our words are going to be more impulsive. And when we're dysregulated, our nervous system is going to look a little bit more like this. Okay. So when you look at this, you can see that we're like getting activated and we're getting, we're going up and down and up and down and up and down. And this up and down can be emotionally. It can be with your energy, right? It can just be the feelings in your body, right? So for example, for me, when I'm dysregulated, I get anxious. And if I were to get, if I were to like, so on a good day, right? Car, almost get into an accident, swerve, heart rate goes up. I go into that sympathetic arousal. And then once I'm safe, whew, I'm back, put the music back on. I'm chilling again, right? When I'm already anxious, right? Car, almost get to an accident, swerve, and then I'm ruminating. What if I died? What happens to my kids if I die? Oh my God, my, like, and I am spending the rest of the day planning my death and the demise of the rest of my family. Can anybody relate, right? So when our nervous system is running way too much energy, we don't go in that flow. We're not like, oh, he's just something stressful. I handled it, I went down. We can get, so some of us, 
And this is something um, Nesil or Mr. Lopez. I don't know. How, I'm not saying your name correctly. Nesil. Um, yeah, Nesil's. Nesil's. Okay. That, you, that I was alluding to with you. I was like, oh, my graph. I can't wait to show him the graph. Right. And I don't know if you resonate, but like some of us, when we have too much stress energy or unresolved trauma or all of it, right, in our nervous system, we get stuck up here on on. We're the ones who move faster. We can't stop, right? We're super productive. And society really validates us, by the way, because we get shit done, right? But we often plow everybody around us. I see some of you smiling. We're all like, oh my God, yeah. Um, so that's information, right? Like when I'm stressed, I'm like, you know, I'm cleaning the house. I'm washing the floors. I'm starting a new project. I'm, I'm mad that everybody else is not moving as fast as me because they're all annoying me because they're so slow, right? I also can tend to have anxiety, right? People can have panic attacks. It's our nervous system gets so revved up, right? Sometimes they get so revved up, we're immobilized. We can't do anything. It's just too much, right? Now, some of you, when you have too much energy running through your system, you shut down. You get stuck on off. You're going to get sleepy. You're going to get tired. You're just going to want to binge Netflix for hours on end, right? How many of you relate to that one? You're more the off person, right? So there's the on and the off. And then there's those of us who do both. There's those of us who do both. But the way I like to think about this is like, it's like the electrical wiring in a house, right? So, so imagine that there's, um, there's an electrical storm and all of a sudden there's a rush of electricity, a, a, a voltage surge through the wires. Either there's an explosion, that's like us on people, or the surge protectors turn everything off. That's the off people, right? But for both nervous systems, we have too much energy moving through our nervous system, okay? Whether you're falling asleep or you're panicking, it's too much energy, yeah? And so the off people can look depressed. They can look lethargic, spacey, dissociated, not in their bodies. I didn't know about you off people as an on person. I just thought you were lazy, right? Because in my body... I don't know what it feels like to be sleepy or slow down when I'm stressed, right? Just like you off people probably think we on people are so annoying. <laughs> so this is really important because A, we want to know ourselves. B, as we're in collaboration and working with folks in high stress environments, we want it can help us have some empathy for what we're seeing. Right. And oftentimes, if you're in like partnership or relationship, our partners are the opposite. I don't know about you all, but my partner, when he's stressed, he's like watching a movie on the Netflix. Right. And I'm bringing him like spreadsheets for like the 2021 budget that we need to talk about. You know, he just looks at me. He's like a deer in headlights. Right. Um, when we think about the folks we're working with. Right. Especially in these high stress environments, when we can understand, you know what, we are all trying to cope with this overwhelm. We all have different ways we cope with the overwhelm. It can give us a little bit more understanding, right? Nasils, does that help? Is that useful? Yeah, that's definitely useful. And and I, I, I resonated a lot with like how you explained it with an accident because I think recently, so recently Valentine's Day weekend, I wrecked my car. Mm. And um, for me, it was like one of my little brothers got pretty, pretty, mm. pretty hurt and got cut up. And like, my first instinct was like, worry about him, right? Like get him uh -huh. to the hospital ASAP. Of course. Um, and then like the following day, it was just like, I gotta like, go, 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 like get the insurance stuff straight now. get like, you know, yeah. I was thankful for like being alive and like recognize that, but it was like, I wanted to get all these things done. And it was like, and I realized it till like three days later, like one of my really good friends helped me kind of get back home and everything and I was like I'm sorry because like I was like go 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 and didn't even yeah. like I wasn't in the moment like just appreciative for like being alive and I was like yeah. trying to call the insurance and deal with the insurance of course. Like, get things done so I can get back to what I wanted to do yeah. and, and it, it yeah and part of it is like recognizing that right and yeah um, not transmitting that to my little bros either you know yeah yeah. And sometimes life makes it so we have to go, go, go. Right. Too. It's like, sometimes there's not a choice, right? You don't have time to like stop and release it. Like you have to, there's still more things that have to get done as well. Right. Sometimes it's external as well. It's not always just internal. Right. But it sounds like with you, it's both. You have that temperament and you had to deal with all this stuff after. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, you know, in the wild animals, when they go through an overwhelming event, they shake, they literally just shake for a few minutes and they release it from their bodies. Um, and then they move on. But we humans, we often are like, we have to just get to the next thing, right? Because we're not taught. We're not taught to like, feel your body, notice what's going on, right? And that's part of, again, a paradigm that doesn't value healing and a paradigm, quite frankly, of colonization. Because indigenous cultures had these practices. They have practices of healing and of singing and of moving and of shaking. They were literally killed for their practices because they had to be civilized. So I have a friend who's like a, a healer, dancer, singer, and she says, we have civilized ourselves away from our own capacity to heal. We're over civilized. So reclaiming that process is also part of disrupting these larger systems that say, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps, like this individualistic, like you have to be productive. And if you're not productive, you're not valued and your self-care doesn't matter. Right. So part of building a whole, a call, and, and again, like then we get into our work and folks are dying. Folks need us. And our to-do list is really high. So on top of the reality of the work, we want to examine the imprinting of this hyper-productive, hyper-individualistic conditioning that most of us carry, right? We want to get curious about how much can we let go of? We still have to get the work done, right? And where are we adding to it with our own stuff? Where are we adding to it with our own stuff? And that's where that self-care, I really want to get to the self-care now, the like, what are the things that we do to regulate our own nervous systems so we can show up and not perpetuate dynamics that are traumatic or unnecessarily stressful and face those larger dynamics that are not in our control that are harming us and our communities and the folks we're working with, right? How do we clear that? And how do we release that energy? Okay, we're gonna dive deeper into those specific practices next time, but I wanna, like, I wanna talk about this framework of the self-care, okay? And, and you all are gonna get to go to, into groups for a little bit. So just to reiterate that like, in order to release the stress and trauma, we have to really discharge the energy, the energy that was mobilized for the fight fight, we have to discharge it. That requires certain practices. It requires A, to acknowledge the energies there. Like one of you said, I didn't even realize my shoulders were tight because we're not even paying attention to ourselves, right? So step one is what are you feeling, right? And really believing that you deserve that, right? So before I ever teach workshops on self-care, I ask people the question I'm about to ask you all because I could teach you all the self-care in the world, but if you don't actually believe you deserve it, you're not gonna do any of it. And then you'll feel shitty about not doing the self-care thing. So I don't wanna set you up for that, right? <laughs> So um, the first thing here is that self-care isn't selfish, okay? Self-care is about being grounded in ourselves so that we can be in community more deeply, supporting people more deeply. And I want to say that self-care is something we do together. It's not just individualistic. It's also about community care and supporting each other, okay? But a lot of us have internalize these ideas about self-care. We talked about this at the very beginning and we're gonna come back to that right now, okay? So I want you to start thinking about what did you learn about self-care in your family of origin? And that often is related to the role you played in your family of origin. So like in my family, okay, we come here from Lebanon, I'm the oldest, my dad is an alcoholic, my mom doesn't speak English, right? And she gets thrown into this life. She discovers that her husband's also addicted to drugs, but decides she needs to save him. And so she's going to stay with him. And me, the baby, I'm going to, her having a baby is going to save the family. So I was literally born into like, I will save the family. Okay. So I took that on super, like super hardcore. And so in my family, I was my mom's therapist. I was my dad's therapist. I was the mediator. I was reading self-help books in seventh grade, trying to figure out how to help my mom not be depressed. She was diabetic. I was putting her on diets. Took care of everybody. I remember a few years ago, my mom took one of my workshops. She said, Hala, that's everything I need to learn. I said, I know, mom. Like I spent my life <laughs> figuring out how to save you because then you could meet my needs. I wanted mom to be okay 
So I could be okay, but mom wasn't okay and dad wasn't okay, right? So I figured if I could figure out how to help them be okay, then I would be okay, right? So was there room for my self-care? No way, because I was trying to get mom to take care of herself, right? So I was hyper-focused on that. I was hyper-focused on dad. Is he drunk? Is he sober? How do I need to be? How I was doing was not really relevant to my well-being. I had to orient to the people around me figure out how they were doing what they needed. That's why I'm a great therapist, right? Like, what have you talked about that? That's your superhero power, right, Griselda, right? So, so, um, so I want you to think about for you what your story is like. So the questions are, and we're gonna go into the groups in a moment. I'll put them up here. What role did you play in your family of origin? And you can just think about like, the savior, the scapegoat. The scapegoat is the one that everybody blames everything on, right? The mediator, the baby, maybe the youngest, right? The parent. Just think about like an archetype or a word, okay? What did you learn about survival, right? So for me, it was like, well, to survive, I have to take care of everybody else. That's why self-care is not important to my survival. And to actually slow down and take care of ourselves, if we have that, is terrifying. It's like we can't let our guard down, right? What did you learn about survival and what did you learn about self-care? And again, I think we shared in the beginning, you know, coming, you know, an immigrant family, like there was no self-care. There's, there's like you, you get, you identify with being a victim. You identify with like, if you're not working hard and almost about to fall over, you have no worth. Okay. So don't accept it just yet, but, but in a moment, if you want to take a snapshot of this, you can. Um, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go into small groups and take turns to talking and answering these questions. Okay. So I do want you to take about a minute here to just see if you want to journal, like write some answers down. Actually, let's just take a moment of silence. So you can like journal a little bit, and write some of these questions down or meditate on it. Okay. All right. And then from here, we'll go into our groups. And I think, are we able to have groups of like three? Um, And I think this time we only will do about like three minutes each for sharing. So like we'll do 10 minute groups. So we have some groups of three and some groups of four. We had a couple participants um, who had to leave for another meeting. Okay. Um, Mostly it's groups of uh, one, um, one facilitator and three participants. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So we'll go in for 10 minutes. Welcome back, everybody. So as a way to share back with each other, we're actually going to post some of our answers if you want on a Jamboard. Um, So in the chat, so if you click on the link in the chat, that's going to appear in a moment, it's gonna ask you if you like to just input into this document what the role was that you played and um, what, I'm forgetting the second one we put in the Jamboard, was it what strengths or abilities you have? So just as a way for us to see other people's experience, is somebody gonna put the Jamboard in the chat? Okay, good. Therese Julia is gonna do it. So if you click on that, 
Then you can just input, you can answer the question at the top. There's two of them. And I think you slide over to the right and you get the second one. And we can just see where folks are at. There it is. So put in your answers, the role you played. And then you can go to the second one and do the second one. You can put it in as a sticky note if you like, or a picture. You can put a few answers in if you want. I love watching this get populated, it's so interesting. Once you've written yours, take a look at the other ones that are showing up and see if you resonate, what else you see. I mean, there's such a theme here, right? In terms of the roles that people played the glue to hold it all together. Oh my gosh. Do you all see a theme here? <laughs> yeah. And so as you are examining, right, these like lots of limiting beliefs about self-care, right? But then I'm seeing some positive ones on here. Um, I want you to start thinking about revisioning what that self-care is. And so part of your homework, there's homework, is what belief about self-care could you craft as something you want to work towards? And not like something boring, like self-care is good, right? But like something that would inspire you, like, you know, self-care, you know, is about me loving myself and being able to show up in my community more fully, like think about what you want to create for yourself. You can write it on a sticky and put it like in your mirror every morning when you're brushing your teeth, right? Um, this can be something, and I know, I don't know, Tessa, if you're going to talk about it later, but like we're really encouraging you all to meet in your groups in between sessions, right? So I think we'll be sending you some prompts, but this could be something to investigate because once we can really ground in, in knowing that we deserve self-care and it's vital and why, then in our next workshop, when we go into deeper, these healing practices, it's more likely that you will do them for yourself because they're not bumping up against a belief that says, no, 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 I can't, I'm, I'm too identified with my pain to actually do this, right? So um, I do, we have to close in a moment because we're going to do some closing stuff. So I want you to invite you to just take a moment to check in with yourself again. And I want you to start to feel for this belief, this guide that you want to bring in around your own worth, your own well-being, your own health, your own right to be well. Right? And maybe if you want, you can put your hands on your body again. If you want to close your eyes, you can. And as you are breathing, I'm going to call in one of my favorite Buddhist prayers, and I'm gonna focus on the part that's about yourself and just offering yourself this prayer. May I be well, 
may I be free from suffering. And you can add whatever words you want. May I be well, may I be free from suffering. May I be happy. Just offer yourself a prayer right now, saying whatever words resonate, praying for your own well being. Again, knowing that this is part of our community care. This is part of showing up for beloved community. May I be well, may I be free from suffering. And even if you don't believe it, practice saying those words to yourself. Even if you don't believe it, what if you were okay? What would that mean in terms of your own identity, your work, your relationships? Let's take two more full cycles of breath together here. One more. And if you want to take one more big stretch, ah, roll your shoulders. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pass the mic. I'm not sure who's next to do some closing, but I will be back with you, Scarlett and I, next time together. We'll go deeper into healing practices. Thank you, Hala. Thank you, Hala. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any remarks that you want to talk about, or like just talk about any takeaways, um, we're going to put in the evaluations just to see what sat well with you, what didn't in order to improve, and I have it in the chat. But thank you so much. And thank you for everyone in the space, because I feel my emotions. I don't know if it's Pisces season, but like, I just want to give everyone a virtual hug because I'm so appreciative of this space. So appreciative of y'all for being here. And just like talking about trauma is just so difficult. And now I'm just thinking about like the love, like, I don't know, just feels bright just after you know, this two hours of being together. So thank you so much. And if you want to say anything else, feel free to say in the chat, you can speak right now. But I love you guys. <laughs> <Through the screen. laughs> and we're going to send them the resources, right, everybody? Because like, if you want to, like, I have a YouTube channel with lots of different meditations and talks and practices, right? We'll have a whole re referral list, but okay. So check out our website that you all are a part of. It's only for this group. It's not a public website. Um, we can put, uh, maybe Vanessa, you can put the, the link in the chat. And we have resources there, including a membership that Hala has kindly gifted to everyone in this program for free, where you can hear her talk about these topics. You can get med practices, meditation, and yoga. She has a YouTube channel. There's a lot there. Bobby can tell you, some of us who have been participating can tell you. It's a lot of resources. So after today's feeling kind of intense. If you want some more places to digest this and process and work through, there's you're not sort of alone, you have that stuff there. And then we'll also be adding more resources to the website of places where you can find therapy, where you can find support groups of other things um, and our communities so that you don't have to navigate this alone. But if you can take a moment now, as Keely just said, to, to put some thoughts in that link um, that she put in the chat um, how did this land for you today? How do you feel? Um, what are you taking away? And what, what, what are you still wondering about? What questions do you still have? And what do you want from future sessions? If you can give us that feedback, then we can continue to customize these sessions for you. Um, and I'll reiterate what Hala already said, which is that we will send you some prompts to work on in the third week with your staff together, and then also some prompts to work on by yourself for the fourth week. But next week, Hala is going to be back again, offering another session, which is really just like people said to us, we just want to like, tell me what to do. Like, so when the stress is hard in the moment, like, what do I do? Just give me, give me the goods, Hala. So she's going to continue to give the goods. And next Friday, she'll be here for just one hour, three o'clock next Friday, giving some practices that you can do in your body for grounding and self-regulation around these issues of trauma and resilience and healing. So come back for more of that next Friday. Um, and then um, we'll give you some prompts for you to continue to reflect on this on your own.
What about Zoom stress or Zoom fatigue? Um, how do we recover from that? Or how do you practice wellness in all the Zoom spaces or virtual spaces? Um, you know, it's a lot of the same tools, but you know what I do? If I have a lot of Zooms, when I can, I take my camera off and I go walking while I'm on the Zoom or I'm on my back stretching. You know, I just make sure, you know, I give myself that space when I can. And sometimes people don't know. You can just tell them your camera's not working. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, and like checking your eyes, you know, all that stuff. That's just one. I mean, aside from all the other tips of like, all the other self-care that we do, but Zoom is one of the stressors. Um, but moving our bodies is really vital. I don't know if that helps, but. It did, thank you. Ronya, I know it's not always possible in certain circumstances, but I also think doing some of this in our Zoom spaces, you know, we take time in the classes I teach for us to like check in, how are we doing, right? do some little stretching or something in our bodies. And I feel like the more we create community, it helps it not feel so fatiguing to be in the space together um, because it's actually a nourishing space. Now we can't always do that when we got like the to-do list, <laughs> staff meeting or knocking things out, but in the places and the times that we can, it, it like Hala did at the beginning, you know, just a few minutes to just to check in or move or breathe together can actually shape shift the experience of Zoom. Thanks for saying that, Tessa. I already added actually like one of the check-ins that we did to a meeting agenda that I have in an hour. Yeah. So appreciate it. Yay. Yeah, just to jump on what Tessa said, I absolutely agree. I think if just adding a few minutes of these, um, you know, little reflections or body movement or breathing really just kind of shifts the dynamic in the meeting. Um, I just want to say, I know I sort of said this before, but I just want to reiterate, you know, this is a, a really, Hala is such a wonderful teacher and she's funny and she's nurturing. So it makes it easier to take all this in, but it's heavy material, right? So just, just notice yourself today, tomorrow, this weekend, if you need to just take it back a notch and check in with yourself and basics of just breathing and drinking water and trying to fill your feet on the floor and doing the orienting activities, whatever you can do to help regulate and feel yourself present um, to just, you know, it's like if you got your wisdom teeth pulled, you don't just go out and go eat a hard candy afterwards. Like <laughs> treat yourself well, recognize like it's a little bit of painful stuff that we, we dealt with. So give that some, some recognition and space if it needs it. Thank you so much for saying that, Tessa. Just think about integration, right? Take a bath <laughs> if you can. Integration is a good word to think about to let yourself integrate this. Because even if you feel okay, your psyche got stirred up and your body maybe got stirred up too. So use your tools too. So before we close, I just want to do another huge thanks to Hala. Hala is our in-house uh, co leader collaborator on this project. Uh, she gets big bucks to do this all around the world, but she's coming to us for free because she loves this work. She loves you all. She believes in us really doing work on the front lines with the folks doing work on the front lines. So I just want to shout out Hala. Thank you for giving us mm -hmm. your time and Thank energy. Thank you. And I'm honored to be we, here. The big bucks we pay you are just in our lives. <laughs> it's in love. It's, it's, it, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Karma. <laughs> Karma. <laughs> so um, um, I, I appreciate um, if all the members of our leadership team can just raise their hand. Scarlett and Vanessa and Asusana, Keely and Therese. Uh, Dahlia is not with us today, but just those folks are like meeting all the time behind the scenes to try to get everything ready for this program. So much thanks and gratitude to you all. And thanks to all of you as participants. Join us back next Friday for an hour, and then we'll see you again the next month. And uh, feel free to reach out to us before then. Thank you all so much. <laughs>